seems like more and more um, our modern devices are often used for not good purposes. Um, they in themselves are not the problem, it's the people who use them. And uh, I was reminded just, I think a couple of, I think it's within recent weeks, maybe a couple of months ago now, a TV actress who's, who did a post on Twitter, probably many of you know who I'm talking about, um, I think she's a, considered a comedian as well, and she posted something about a former president advisor, presidential advisor. Now, she said that what she wrote was a joke, and she also said in part she was influenced by medication. But she said it was in bad taste and she did ask for forgiveness. Now, the president of the network where her TV show appeared did not consider it to be a laughing matter. He said it's abhorrent, repugnant, and inconsistent with our values, which is kind of ironic when you stop and think about it. But nonetheless, the actress has made many appearances expressing sorrow, apologizing, and seeking to articulate, trying to convince people that she's not a racist. As a result, not only did she lose her job, but the show was canceled and everybody who worked on the show lost their jobs as well. And I thought about it, it's amazing what problems one Twitter post can generate, the impact that they can have. And this is a reminder of our passage today in the sense that our tongue, it might be small, but it's a major problem, isn't it? It's just this little device in our mouth, just dangling there. And yet, if it's not controlled by the Spirit, it just causes all kinds of problems. Our passage today, as I said, is not really an uplifting one. It gives us these characteristics of our tongue. It just kind of leaves us there with, now what are we supposed to do? Our tongues are boastful, our tongues are destructive, and our tongues are out of control. We're going to work through the passage and then, um, to add to our misery, I want us to spend some time doing a self-evaluation. And as I said, uh, th after this week, I'm, not only am I tired, I just feel like this passage is, is it's, it's not very uplifting. And so I pray that the Spirit might be gracious to us and, and move in ways that are necessary and good for us and for those around us. If you are a teacher of God's Word, you already know you've been warned in this passage, so it's important for you to pay particular attention to what's being said. But for all of us as believers, I think we would have to acknowledge we got a problem and it's our tongue and it needs to be addressed. So if you would, please stand with me. I'm going to read the first eight verses of James chapter 3. And then in order to resolve it to some degree, we're going to say our reference again that we're memorizing verse 13. So listen now first to the first eight verses. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, the creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Let's say verse 13 together. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. It's always a blessing for me to have my dad here. I'm going to ask you to pray for me in a moment, but recognizing Eric and, and honor of him, but also I know you want to honor the Lord. Would you pray for the folks at the church today? And Dad, if you pray for me today, let's go to the Lord and pray. I feel like I'm just bordering on that, um, on that line of wanting to apologize today because it's just, it's just not encouraging our text. But I, 
I would pray that maybe God would use this just for us to sit, as already been prayed, underneath the authority of his word, and then examine ourselves and, our, and how we use our tongues. We begin with the thought that James states that our tongues are boastful. A little member that boasts of great things. James has already illustrated that it's small. Um, you'll recall that he spoke about horses and bits and ships and rudders. And in both cases, he spoke about a great vessel that was large, a horse and a ship, a small instrument, a bit or a rudder, and then the one who directed it, the pilot or the rider. doesn't matter how big or how small they are. It has to do with that instrument, and that will adjust the vessel where it's going accordingly. So there's, our tongues are small, they're little, but they boast of great things. This is the only time in the New Testament that this particular word for boasting appears. But you don't have to worry. The word for boasting, there's other terms for it in the New Testament, the Old Testament as well, and there's plenty of examples. And I was trying to think about how we might best illustrate the idea of boasting. And for me, I, I readily, quickly go to King Nebuchadnezzar. You remember him? Uh, back in that particular era, uh, a man who had great ability, great strength, but he boasted in it, didn't he? And God saw fit to humble man. Go with me to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Sadly, I think this is um, a good example uh, of what it means to boast. Where all the focus is on me, myself, and I. And that's what we see in Daniel chapter 4. And we pick up in Daniel chapter 4, verse 28. Uh, Daniel's given the interpretation of a dream about what's to take place. And part of that is King Nebuchadnezzar. His pride, his boasting and how God humbled the man. Daniel chapter 4, 28, And all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the twelve months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. And now you'll notice the emphasis here. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? There it is, isn't it? You, you see right there just the pride and the boasting and you know God humbled the man, verse 31, while the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. That isn't, that isn't all. They shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Aren't you thankful that God is gracious to us? How often should we be struck down? having made our boast about how strong or how mighty we think we are. What is the problem with boasting? It shows a lot of pride, doesn't it? Typically means that we try and elevate ourselves above reality. We try and exaggerate what is to make ourselves feel better. But as I was thinking about it, I think there's always a connection to God with boasting as well. I think we either do one of two things when we boast as it relates to God. First of all, we put ourselves above God. We think that we're the ones who have done it. We think that we're in control, that we're in charge. And if we don't do that, then I think the other way we might boast is the thought that we're independent of God. Maybe we're not as bold as to say we're above Him, but certainly we're independent of Him. And we can do what we want and when we want to do it. You know, it's interesting in the New Testament. Paul says, listen, as it relates to salvation, if you're able to save yourself, if somehow you can come up with a system whereby you can say to God, God, look at all the good that I have done, and now I should be acceptable in your sight. I have enough merit based upon what I've done. He says, then you would have a reason to boast. But he says, so that there can be no boasting, salvation is of the Lord. It is the work of God, not the work of you and I. And it's interesting, you and I should boast as individuals. But our boast should not be in ourselves, but rather in whom? In the Lord and in Christ. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9. If, you, if you're in the book of Daniel, you just go back a couple of books, you, you'll find Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 9, you'll be, oh, I know these verses is what you'll think when we see them. They're verses that you've heard over and over again. 
And now you'll re hopefully remember where they are. Jeremiah chapter 9. Go down to verse 23. First and foremost, there's a warning. Jeremiah 9, 23. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. And oh, by the way, in part, you might ask why, because where did the wisdom come from? Where did the might come from? Where did the rich come from? It all comes from the hand of the Lord. But if there is to be boasting, here it is. But let him who glories, let him who boasts glory in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, says the Lord. Isn't it fascinating when you combine that with Daniel? He puts Daniel down until he knows the Most High God. And here in Jeremiah, we're told if there's to be a boast, boast in the Lord. That you know and you understand Him. And more profound that we know Him is that He knows us. And He has loved us. As I've already mentioned, I did a funeral this last week. Um, yesterday was the funeral for a fine man. Um, for me, it was kind of an interesting dynamic to be back in my hometown um, where I grew up. And my dad was the chief of police there and now doing a funeral for the chief of police of Highland seeing individuals that I hadn't seen for years and, and feeling a degree, but n not the degree that the family must feel of loss and, and sadness. And um, feeling overwhelmed as we drove through town. The, um, it was complete, it was very, very honoring, all the first responders. There must have been at least 30 vehicles that let out of fire trucks and ambulance and police and, and the different communities that came in, different communities that came in to run all of the things for the city so that this funeral could take place, and hundreds and hundreds of people there. And then, uh, you know, one of the things that's sad in our world today is when there's funeral processions, you rarely see people pull over. But this particular day, there were people outside holding up flags, taking a moment as the procession passed by that took some 20 or 30 minutes, and individuals pulled over and stopped, and then we got to the cemetery and all these people have gathered and he was a Marine, so there was the 21 gun salute, the presentation of a flag and all of this that was taking place. All of these uh, policemen and women in uniform lined up in rows, standing still. And I couldn't help but think about all that's taken place and, and the honor was due this man, don't get me wrong. But he would be the first one to say, this is way too much. There's too much attention being put on me. Having known him and having all the all the people who gave testimony in the family, they would have said, he wouldn't want all of this. He would have wanted all the glory to go to God. You know, it's fascinating, up in a, in a town where he served for 20 years as a policeman, there's a statue of him in that city. Uh, there's a statue of a policeman kneeling down, talking to a little boy, and it was in the likeness of, of this man. And I'm sure in his heart he was thinking, I don't want to be there. I don't want the attention. And that's a wise thing, folks. It's a wise thing to not boast, but rather the focus to go on the Lord. Because James lets us know that when we boast, we head down a destructive path. And James continues with that theme. Now with another illustration, he talks about ships and, and rudders and horses and bits. And now he talks about a little spark and, and, and an enormous expansive fire. Go back with me to James again, chapter 3, and see how James continues to develop this theme that our tongues are a major problem because they are destructive. Listen again now to the end of verse 5 and verse 6. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. That last phrase disturbs me. There is a connection here that should disturb every one of us. If we sing the song about what is connected, the backbone's connected to the shoulder bone, the shoulder bone's connected to the neck bone, and so forth and so on. But if we sing the song about the heart, the heart is connected to the tongue, and the tongue is connected to hell. There is a demonic influence that comes against us as it relates to our tongue. Now please, 
Don't misunderstand. The Bible does not teach, if you're a believer, that you can be possessed by a demon. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and there is no room for the evil one to take up residency. But I've mentioned it before. I'm convinced, though, if our eyes were open right now to spiritual things, we would see spiritual beings in this place that are competing right now, whispering. And, and God is fighting on our behalf, but those whispers and the impact of the evil forces, and it's not just a force field. There are creatures that would, that would seek to destroy us and impact the things that we say. And our tongues are a world of iniquity. This is to suggest that they have their own system, like an ecosystem. An ecosystem of our tongue that is evil, that is rebellious, that is lawless if it's not controlled by God. And if it's not, it's only contrary to God. And James says it permeates our entire person so that it defiles the whole body. If you think about the illustration that it's developing, it's just a little spark. And maybe if it helps you to think about forest fires that rage out west, where someone uh, forgets to take care of a, a little campfire, or someone just flicks a cigarette, and that little spark sets on, on fire a blaze that is destructive, but it's more than just the fire. James says it contaminates the entire entire system, so you have to think about the smoke that goes with it. And, and maybe you've been around where there was a fire. You know what I'm talking about. You come out and you smell like smoke. Years ago, I, I used to take a gentleman to breakfast in our church who was older than me, and now I realize he is about the same age that I am now. Suddenly, he doesn't seem so old. But I used to take him on Thursday mornings to breakfast, and we used to frequent a place out on, on the west end of Fairview Heights that back in our day... You'll recall that you were allowed to smoke in restaurants. Now, this one in particular had a section for smoking and for non-smoking. We sat in the non-smoking. It didn't make a bit of difference. Because after we had our eggs and our bacon, and that was great, I'd come home and I'd have to wash all my clothes. This is the way the tongue works. It permeates everything so that there's a stench about you. And it says it goes further because it impacts your journey. It sets on fire the course of nature, which refers to your journey, your path, your life. So let's just stop and think about this for a moment. You say something inappropriate. First and foremost, that reveals something about your heart. Something's not right. But it also would, would remind us in this passage that you've been impacted by demonic forces. And don't think it's benign because it will contaminate your entire system. And then it will set you on a path of further destruction. So can there be anything said other than our tongues are out of control? And this is what James says in verses 7 and 8. Every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I was uh, this last week as we went up and uh, visited with the family up the passing of, of of this man, um, they have a dog that's very, very active, very, very energetic. And um, every time we've gone up there, he's just bouncy, bouncy, you know, and all over. And, and they try and get him to sit down and be controlled. This time I went in, I sat on the sofa, and he came up and sat on the sofa beside me and was still. And the family said, this never happens. I said, oh, I've got this figured out. I know how to deal with dogs. You just ignore them, and they'll be just fine. And the dog sat there the entire time, and I ignored the dog the entire time. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our tongues were that way? If we just ignored them, they'd settle down. But James says, nope, it's an unruly evil. It's unstable. It's like an element that's about to implode. And its content, he says, is full of deadly poison. A venom that would end life if having the opportunity. So now we've heard the text, and now it gets worse. Because now I want us to sit there for a couple of moments and evaluate ourselves. And so I want to bring back the sins of the tongue. And you can look up these references. Um, several of you have asked for this. Um, I was thinking this last week, if we were the speech police, we could put this on business cards. And we could walk around when someone says something inappropriate, we could just circle on the front and hand them the card. And say, here's your ticket. And then I thought to myself, that's probably what we typically do. 
is we probably spend our time evaluating other people. And I feel like it would be better for us to evaluate ourselves, so I thought maybe if we can invent an app on our phone. Um, I've been told that our phones listen to us all the time. If we could actually get them to help us and listen, and as soon as we've said something inappropriate for start flashing and honking and vibrating and yelling at us, violation of number four, you've just slandered somebody. Maybe our phones would then be productive. Our heart and our tongue are connected. There's a connection to hell itself. Our courses of life can go down a path of destruction. So let's just take a moment to think about boasting. This is the, the major thought that James has for us of boasting, elevating ourselves, being needy for attention, desperate for affirmation, feeling like someone needs to see us, to recognize us, to appreciate us. And if it isn't happening, then we boast in order for others to look at us. And we boast about the things that we feel like we can control or who we can control. And oftentimes, the truth of the matter is when we're out of control, we want to control something. And then we boast as if we've done something. So how are we doing with boasting? Do we present ourselves as above God or independent of God? And can I challenge you that if you're in a home and in relationships with other individuals, to take away their opportunity to boast? And what I mean by that, be the one who gives them affirmation. Be the one who gives them appreciation and attention. Let them know that they've done well. I mentioned to the girls who lost their dads that they were so blessed to have a mom and dad who not only loved one another, but liked one another. And it showed up in how they spoke to one another, how they appreciated one another. There was no need for boasting because they affirmed one another. I could probably run us through all of these, but maybe just a couple of more groupings, if that'll help. Slander, gossip, and cutting words. Our words do not have the same power as God's. God speaks and it's done. It's created, it's brought to life. That's, that's the story of redemption, by the way. He spoke to that which is dead, and he gave it life, regeneration, so that we are the children of God. But our words can really have a big impact on people, can't they? And our words are supposed to be words which build people up, words of grace, not tearing down others. So I would ask you today, the words that you speak, do they build up, or do they cut and tear down? Are they Christ-like words, or are they unrighteous? My oldest son and I have been talking as of late about relationships and relationship problems. And I think he and I are going to work on a book. One of these days I'll write one of them. Maybe he'll be part of that journey. But he and I were talking about how in relationships it's so important to address problems. Now, first and foremost, when there's a problem, let me encourage you to go to the Lord in prayer. And pray to the Lord. And don't pray this way. Dear God, please help that person because they've lost their minds. They really need your grace. Pray honestly and say, Lord, examine where I'm struggling, where I'm wrong. Help me to be part of the solution, part of your grace. And Lord, whatever their struggle is too, please be their God. Then having prayed, and if God isn't resolving it, then you need to talk. You need to address it. Because if you don't, it festers within you. You grow angry, there's bitterness, there's an unsettledness. And then finally, when you finally say something about it, what happens? You throw up on the other person. And you feel better. Because you got it out. And they're there looking in the mirror going, what just happened here? That can't be how we handle problems, folks. We've got to deal with them early and graciously with words of humility. And words that put the greater bearing of responsibility on ourselves for what's taking place. How are we doing? Make one more pass today. Lying, complaining, and rash words. So it's, it's school's back in, right? Amen. Can I get an amen on that? However, that means there'll be more yelling in the homes of the children and more children complaining and grumbling, right? Praise the Lord. Here we go. It's all chaotic again. That shouldn't be the way the Christian household is run. It, it shouldn't be yelling. It shouldn't be grumbling. I think I heard another word this week about lying. I've heard untruths and half-truths, and there was another one I heard this week, so now I've got to go back and find out what it is. 
And then we've already touched on the idea of boasting, but there's a lie when we talk about ourselves above what is real and true. That's a lie. And if I could throw this thought out at us, do people even want to be around us? After it's all said and done, the way we talk, the way we interact, do people even want to be around us? How in the world can we build up one another and present Christ to the world if they don't even want to be around us? Thinking to myself, once we get done with James chapter 3, no one in CBC is going to talk anymore. We're just going to shut the whole thing down. It's going to be hand signals and smiles and grimaces. We'll probably have a Sunday where everybody brings their smartphone and their texting devices and we burn them all in a big pile and show what a small fire can do. And then James tells us, guess what? No man can tame the tongue. And I, I come to this passage last night, I'm like, ugh. All right, let's sing a song. <laughs> Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so, let's go home. I'm so thankful last night the elder who con concluded the message gave us some hope because I didn't leave us there. Rather, I said at the end, let me add a couple other thoughts. I think of this passage, I think about Job. I think about Job who finally God breaks through the silence and he says, okay, Job, you think you're big? Put on your big boy pants, let's have a conversation. I got some questions for you. Let's see how you do and what does Job do? I think I opened my mouth once or twice, but it's, I'm done. I'm done. I think about the passage that we looked at last week in Psalm 141. Lord, please set a guard over my mouth. Put a muzzle on my tongue. And I'm reminded in the, in the, in the message of Isaiah that the Lord has to work. And the only way that's going to take place is if we are painfully aware of the presence of God. Because I, Isaiah then, in the presence of God, with a, an instrument that we cannot tame, we will confess, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. Our tongues need a master, and it must be God. So with the benediction that was offered last night, I want to close out in Jude. So turn with me to Jude, so that we might have some hope. Because we know we cannot do it, we know ultimately, yeah, there's time, and we, let's confess, with some people we hold it, and other people we let it fly, but unless the Lord is the master of our tongue, it's not going to take place. And so with this hope being offered, please stand. And then we will close out with a song. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever, and all of God's children can say what? Amen and amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we must confess to you today what is true, that we can't control our tongues. And we all, right now, probably to a certain degree, should be fearful knowing that it's just a matter of moments until we see that realized. And we would be those who would want to try and distance ourselves and say, it's just our tongue. But we know it reveals what's going on in our hearts, and we know we're being impacted, and we know that we are not yielding to your Spirit. Your Word is not dwelling in us richly like it must, and it, and it, it, it has to, God. And yet, Lord, I'm so thankful that you can do above and beyond what we ask, imagine, or think. And I'm asking you, Lord, please to do that. If we need to be silent, Lord, then shut us down. But if you would be gracious to us and allow us to speak, may our tongues be controlled by you so that we might offer you praise and words which build up others and present your Son, Jesus Christ, in all of his glory to a lost and dying world. Please be God. Please be gracious. With this tongue that tends towards evil and wickedness, please. 
Please be God. I pray in Jesus' name.